something later. First created in St. Louis in the 1850s as an attempt on the part of citizens to provide protections and services not otherwise provided by government, private places are legally sanctioned enclaves within the city grid, characterized by highly articulated street hier hierarchies as well as sophisticated development controls. Private places are not owned by the host city, but by the property owners themselves, who as members of a street association fund per physical maintenance, including that of trees, streets, parks, lighting, sewers, and even pay for security and maintenance personnel. Typically, a private place consists of a landscaped boulevard that helps give the illusion of life in a garden. The closure of some private places to through traffic adds to the feeling of a quiet refuge apart from, yet embedded in the city. Forest Park Edition, perhaps the finest of St. Louis's far private places, was laid out by the landscape planner Julius Pitzman on 78 acres bordering the, bordering the city's principal park. Restrictions were severe. Only one house was permitted on each of the 100 by 190 foot, five foot lots, and each design had to be approved by the association. Just as Ebenezer Howard's Garden City idea was gaining worldwide attention, and you can see examples of this, uh, pub, uh, his ideas translated into many languages, the English architects Barry Parker and Raymond Hood Unwin uh, set out to give the garden suburb an architectural grammar, definitively documented in Unwin's 1909 book, Town Planning in Practice. Arguing against overcrowding, Unwin convincingly demonstrated how typical London bylaw, which is a term, housing, could be replaced with blocks of lower density perimeter houses in which streets and alleys were replaced by parks and playgrounds. And in the process, they would, uh, and landlords, landowners would be a benefit over time by developing twice the land at half the density. Equally important, the books also saw garden suburbs in terms of the public space of streets, which would be designed as what Unwin called street pictures. In 1903, work began on Parker and Unwin's first major project, initially called First Garden City, but renamed Letchworth after it became clear that it wasn't a city at all, but a commuter suburb of London 34 miles away. Parker and Unwin's masterwork, Hampstead Garden Suburb, was firmly embedded in London itself. Begun two years after Letchworth, Hampstead Garden Suburb was realized at the initiative of Henrietta Barnett, whose intention was to create a garden suburb for the working classes. Barnett conceived the suburb with her husband, the Reverend Samuel Augustus Barnett, whose parish lay in London's overcrowded East End slum district. When the Barnetts learned in 1896 of plans to build the first completely tunneled underground railway north from Charing Cross, with a station to be located at Golden Green's cross, Golden, Golders Green Crossroads near Wilde's Farm, a 323-acre property owned by Eaton College, they took immediate action, it, launching a campaign to purchase 80 acres of the property for use as open space extending Hampstead Heath and dedicating the rest of the land as Hampstead Garden Suburb. Parker and uh, 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 many of you may know that that's where Sigmund Freud left his, his, fi his final moments in G Hampstead Garden Suburb, and it is the shrink capital of London at the present. <laughs> Parker and Unwin's plan combined residential neighborhoods evocative of traditional northern villages with a formal central square that reflected the American City Beautiful movement of the time. The square was basically the work of Edwin Lutyens, and it is a masterpiece of precise geometry, 
punctuated by two churches and defined at its edges by an institute and terraced houses. Unfortunately, the central square is not where the action is because it is not located near the tube station or the commerce of F Finchley Road, where a pair of buildings providing shops and apartments above form the suburb's gateway. Hampstead's residential neighborhoods reflect the ideals set out in Unwin's book. Eve lines and roof pitches were kept virtually uniform. Colors were muted and housing, houses were grouped in pairs or fours or even longer rows along streets and notably around courtyards or greens. Particular attention was paid to the arrangement of buildings at street intersections so that positive spaces were established throughout the suburb, suburbs plan. Streets were never overly long and were often terminated by the gable of a house set on access. Mid-block cul-de-sac, grouped houses around um, greensworths large enough for the lawn tennis courts that were provided. Everywhere, the idea of the street picture was adhered to, perhaps most dramatically at the so-called Bailey Scott Corner, which you see here, southeast of Meadway and Hampstead Way, one of the most memorable bits of the suburb. An artisan's quarter was created to meet Mrs. Barnett's request for a neighborhood for the industrial classes. Barnett also planned for the specific needs of the elderly, the blind, and working women uh, from whom, for whom Waterloo Court was designed, Waterloo Court, sorry, um, uh, by M.H. Bailey Scott as a grand collegiate quadrangle. Um, aside from the central square, the suburb's most memorable civic feature was the 784 um, uh, uh, 780 foot long great brick wall uh, 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 that marked its border with Hampstead Heath. Punctuated by occasional viewing platforms and interrupted at its midpoint to form a spacious plaza, its design, according to Unwin, was inspired by, quote, old towns which we admire, where the country comes up clean and fresh, right to the point where the town proper begins. In the oldest cities, he continued, we sometimes find a wall with the country coming right up to the gates, which adds to the effect. Forest Hills Gardens in New York's borough of Queens is the American counterpart of Hampstead Garden suburb. In many ways, it improved upon its model. In early in 1909, the Russell Sage Foundation purchased 142 acres of open land that would be directly connected to Pennsylvania Station um, uh, in the following year by newly electrified suburban trains. Intended to set an example for the still rural borough's future growth, the Olmsted brothers, son and nephew of Frederick Law Olmsted, were hired as planners and Grosvenor Atterbury as architect. The overall layout of Forest Hills Gardens evokes the character of an evolved rural village, stretching from the station square to the 500-acre Forest Park. In its way, like John Nash's Regents Development in London, it conveys the impression of a metaphoric journey from city to country. As with Hampstead Garden suburb, Forest Hills Gardens <clears throat> benefited from an adjacent major park. And, as with Hampstead Garden Suburb, the original intention to provide affordable accommodations was not fulfilled. Forest Hill Garden's strategic location resulted in a high initial land cost, and very quickly the developers were forced to cater to a more affluent clientele, which Forest Hills Gardens continues to attract to this day. While the central square at Hampstead is separate from the business district, as designed by Atterbury and Olmsted, at Forest Hills Gardens Station Square, with its hotel and apartments, is both the symbolic and commercial focus of community life. Some of you may be old enough to remember when tennis came from Forest Hills, and it was Forest Hills Gardens 
the West Side Tennis Club. That was uh, where it came from. Hon honoring Frederick Law Olmsted's belief in the value of small neighborhood parks, his successor firm, Olmsted Brothers, aerated the plan with green spaces, including the three and one half acre greenway <clears throat> that extended the civicism of Station Square into the suburb suburbs residential heart. Although there were strict design controls, Atterbury, working with other leading architects, saw to it that the neighborhoods were sprinkled with a wide variety of house types, but principally semi-detached and single-family dwellings, many grouped around shared garden spaces and designed by some of the leading residential architects of the day. In a bold and largely successful assault against the American tradition of ornamental but useless front yards, Atterbury demonstrated how even the individual cottage on its own lot could be arranged to create shared open space, as you can see in the right-hand drawing at the top. Atterbury demonstrated, to this day, Atterbury's lot plan remains controversial. For example, Harvard professor John Stilgo has argued that the, quote, pairing of two single-family houses with one two-family double house, while radically shifting traditional arrangements and front and back yards um, in a single blow, also virtually abolished outdoor privacy. But he was a Harvard professor. What does he know? <laughs> While Forest Hills Gardens looks traditional, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the construction of its initial buildings was highly experimental, using nailcrete, a system of prefabricated concrete construction that Atterbury had developed. Here is the nailcrete system during construction and as completed in the Burns Street Group, which used a crescent plan to provide a courtyard buffer between the housing and the Mailroad, uh, Long Island Railroad embankment. Notice that the advanced technology was not used to celebrate itself, but to realize the deeper culture am cultural ambitions for um, vernacular vi village architecture. Lawrence Farms, 40 miles northeast of Grand Central, was the last suburban village principally conceived in terms of the railroad. Unfortunately, developer Dudley B. Lawrence's ambitious plans for the project were stymied by the Depression, but he was able to complete a golf club and a coordinated group of six single-family houses, each on an acre of land, and each designed by a different architect in an interpretation of an early American style. Um, the Garden City and garden suburb movements are predominantly associated with England, the United States, and the major Western countries. However, our research has revealed the global spread of the movement, and as we track the worldwide growth of garden suburbs, we were impressed by the extent to which local community members, many of them amateur historians, take pride in their garden villages and enclaves, and their place in the larger network of their host cities. How sad that though garden suburbs are beloved by their residents, most critics and historians, and dare I say most teachers in schools of architecture, if they bother to take note of them at all, are generally dismissive, falsely characterizing them as exclusive upper, exclusively upper middle class retreats. Our research shows that many garden suburbs were built for workers whom they continue to provide affordable housing for in attractive community settings. For example, in England, William Hesketh Lever, one of the original Lever brothers of the Soap family, established Port Sunlight in 1888. At Port Sunlight, nature and the realities of modern industrial life were honestly reconciled and brilliantly um, uh, recognized. A picturesque village on 130 acres directly adjacent to the factory, Port Sunlight is organized around the Dell, 
a muddy ravine reclaimed as a park. Cottages looked inward to the dell and outward to the factory. Port Sunlight abounds in public buildings, including a community center, schools, and inn, churches, and shops. Importantly, although intended for, faculty, for factory workers, Port Sunlight does not scream out workers' housing. Its houses are angled at street corners and buildings were placed to terminate street views, anticipating Parker and Unwin, so that little or no distinction could be made between individual units in a group and streets would appear to be lined by mansions rather than modest houses. American industrials, industrialists built workers' villages in Lowell, Massachusetts, Pullman, Illinois, at Dakota, New York, near Niagara Falls, where McKinley and White, who everyone in New York thinks only did mega mansions, designed these workers' cottages around 1893. Unfortunately, they did not match English examples in quality, uh, the American um, um, uh, workers' houses, until the federal government got into the act when America's late entry into World War I made it clear that American industry was ill-equipped to produce the ships and munitions needed to support the war effort. One major impediment to boosting production was an unstable workforce rendered transient by a lack of adequate housing. Sounds familiar. Leading the federal government through the uh, Emergency Fleet Corporation and the United States Housing Corporation, which was set up at, uh, quickly, to embark on the country's first foray into public housing. A very controversial move in the eyes of many who regarded it as the thin edge of the socialist sword. <laughs> The wartime program was remarkable not only for its broad scope, over 130 new subdivisions were contemplated, but also for the high quality of the uh, architects and landscape architects employed to design them. But with the quick end to hostilities in 1918, America was in the war only about 19 months, as you know, only a small percentage of what had been contemplated was completed, and Congress, fearing the red peril, killed the initiative. Nonetheless, more than 60,000 people were accommodated in federally sponsored working class garden suburbs, many of considerable and enduring merit, such as Seaside Village, and <clears throat> one of five completed in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Purposely planned with reduced standards so that middle class tenants would not annex the conveniently located workers' housing, in other words, would not gentrify the houses after the war, Seaside Village consists of picturesque streets that recall an old New England village. The irregularities of the plan caused by the location of existing trees was far from arbitrary, and the modest one and a half and two story Georgian style brick houses were so fine that after nearly 100 years, the lessons of this sophisticated garden suburb for factory workers continued to pay dividends. And Seaside Village, nicknamed the Oasis by local police in troubled Bridgeport, remains a stable community amidst the otherwise rundown section of a failing city. Here in New York City, the one attempt to, uh, by the federal program to build housing remained unrealized due to the signing of the armistice. It was to be located on 10 acres in the Mariner's Harbor section of Staten Island. The regular gridiron plan was the work of Arthur Brinkerhoff, Delano and Aldrich, known for many of the most elegant buildings in Manhattan and elsewhere, designed the four-story Georgian-style brick apartment house, as well as five different designs for semi-detached stucco-clad <coughs> houses praised by the editors of the United States House Incorporation Report for the, quote, incorporation of porches in the body of the house, thus magnifying the impression of the size while simplifying the mass. By the 20th, 20th century second decade, the issue of housing reform as a key to good city planning 
had taken preeminence over the design of monumental civic structures characteristic of the City Beautiful movement of the 1890s. In December 1912, the City Club of Chicago, following on the heels of Daniel Burnham's famous 1909 Grand Plan for Chicago, announced a competition calling for a development of a typical but hypothetical quarter section of suburban land on the outskirts of the city. Shown here on the bottom of the slide are the three winning entrants in this competition, and above them, William Drummond's, which was not selected. Which Drummond's plan stands out from the others in its determination to maintain the seemingly endless expanse of the prairie while accommodating the density and formality of the city beautiful. Drummond was a disciple of Frank Lloyd Wright, who also prepared a scheme, but characteristically refused to enter into the competition. Wright boasted that he was above such things, but in reality, he likely feared his scheme would not be selected. Um, he did not like to be humiliated publicly. In any case, like Drummond, Wright synthesized the regularity of the grid and the directionless indeterminacy of the prairie by dividing the quarter section into 64 square blocks threaded through with a network of public parks, and as a result, proposed what was in, in effect a large-scale private place. Just as most of us don't think of Frank Lloyd Wright in connection with garden suburb planning, we also do not associate it with Le Corbusier, the iconoclastic Swiss-French modernist. However, in 1914, six years before he took the name Le Corbusier, charles Edouard jean Gris prepared a design for an unrealized garden suburb in his, in his hometown of La chaux de fonds in Switzerland. Three years later, he tried his hand again at garden suburb planning with a design for a workers' village in the small town of Saint Nicolas de Alemar near Dieppe, Normandy. In place of the curving streets he had proposed in Switzerland, Jean Regri, and guided by the site's elongated trapezoidal shape, positioned 43 houses on either side of a single 18 foot wide spine lined by sidewalks, planting strips, and trees. Only one semi detached house was completed in 1917 before rising costs led to the project's abandonment. In 1924, by which time he had shed his um, uh, arts and crafts, English-influenced approach, Le Corbusier had yet another chance at realizing a garden suburb, a workers' village in Pessac, France, where he attempted to capture the garden suburb's environmental benefits without resorting to the forms of vernacular architecture. At Pessac, Le Corbusier's concept of domestic architecture is as something akin to equipment, you recall that he called houses machines for living in, failed to match the taste preferences of the original inhabitants, who once they began to move in, redesigned their houses in emulation of traditional models. Le Corbusier didn't help matters when he stated that inhabitants should, quote, adapt their mentalities, end quote, to the houses. He had a gift for put-downs. The homeowners did just the opposite to catastrophic effect. Opinions about Pesach have shifted over time, and in recent years, many, but not all, residents have worked hard to restore the houses. While the majority of garden suburbs have been created for year-round living, they have also played an important role in shaping seasonal resorts, especially in the United States. Perhaps this is so because Americans on holiday seem more willing to share public space. So it was that Florida in the boom years of the 1920s saw the development of one of the most significant garden suburbs ever, Coral Gables. Now a suburb of the neighboring city of Miami, Coral Gables began life in 1921 as a new type of suburb, one for long distance commuters who might settle their families there for months at a time while the breadwinner shuttled back and forth between it 
and icy northern cities using trains or automobiles. City-like in scale, encompassing 10,000 acres or 16 square miles, but with no provision for industry except for craft, craft workshops, Carl Gables was developed by George Merrick, working with a team of planners, architects, and artists. The layout of Carl Gables is in many ways straightforward, with a grid of streets defining uh, rectangular blocks running east and west, punctuated by major arterials and occasional diagonal avenues that slice through to form plazas. Miles of canals were included in the plan to lift it far above the conventional subdivision. And, of course, to allow the developer to argue that it offered 40 miles of waterfront. Land was reserved for parks and for a new university intended to provide a cultural focus. The university is the University of Miami. Abundant golf courses were treated as valuable park-like visual assets for all to enjoy, given that at many places the public roads etched the greens, one of which was overlooked by the town's most important landmark, Schultz and Weaver's Miami Biltmore Hotel, same architects who designed the Waldorf Astoria here in New York. Carl Gable's typical residential architecture was mandated to be in the Spanish colonial style. But to avoid monotony, the plan included a number of stylistically distinct thematic villages. One of the 15 plan, of the 15 plan, only seven were realized, including Marion Sims Wyeth's Dutch South African village. Those of you who know Palm Beach know that a Wyeth house is highly coveted. Um, of Andre Stuani and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg, so important to the revival of the garden suburb tradition, live in this house. Henry Killam Murphy's Chinese village in the 1910s and 20s, um, working from his office, Murphy designed some of China's most important public buildings, Tsinghua University, many others, uh, it goes on. He only went to China four times, but he became an expert. This is um, and so he did a Chinese, he was hired to do a Chinese village in um, Coral Gables. There's a French city village designed by a young Mott B. Schmidt, said to be the last of the Georgians uh, here in New York. Um, and this, on a colonial village that the Skinner brothers designed, who were never heard of again. <laughs> Like Hampstead Garden Suburb, Carl Gables was to be enclosed within a wall in emulation of a medieval town. Although Merrick didn't get to fully realize this idea, the money ran out after the 1925 real estate crash because of a hurricane, uh, really a devastating hurricane. He did build four of the seven planned entrance gates that to this day are essential to Carl Gables' status as an oasis amidst metropolitan Miami's surrounding sprawl. The Douglas Gate was the most programmatically complex, suggesting stage and square at Forest Hills Gardens with a tower, entrance hall, ballroom, and two wings of shops and apartments. Perhaps the most ingenious element of Coral Gables was the transformation of an abandoned open pit from which much of the oolitic limestone used to the build the suburbs early houses had been quarried into the Venetian pool, a swim club for residents equipped with caves, a waterfall, diving boards suspended from towering rock formations, a miniature sandy beach, and an island from which Paul Whiteman and his jazz band <laughs> serenaded would-be customers as members of Merrick's army of 3,000 salespeople hawk the development. In the 1920s, in middle Europe, the garden suburb was reinvented to, stu to suit extreme socialist politics that emphasized communal rather than individual expression. I refer to what were called in German Siedlungen, or housing estates. Ernst Mai's work in Frankfurt am Main, Germany, was emblematic of European modernism's usurpation of the garden suburb idea in support of a classless egalitarianism. Mai oversaw the planning and construction of more than 
15,000 dwelling units, or roughly one residence for every fra 11 Frankfurters, Frankfurter, um, in, in 33 separate Siedlungen that formed a ring around the central city. Rejecting the vernacular architecture of the traditional garden suburb, Mai also rejected much of the garden suburb's grammar of hierarchical streets and park spaces in favor of arrangements based on ideal solar orientation. Mai's approach became increasingly diagrammatic as he sought to give physical form to an extreme point of political point of view. As the National Socialists rose to power in the early 1930s in Germany, Mai migrated to Russia and eventually to Africa. Given their point of view, the Nazis rejected modernism's aesthetic and returned to the ideal of the traditional garden suburb. Shown here is Mustersiedlung, Rammersdorf, my German non-existent, located three miles outside of Munich. Designed by Italian-born German architect Guido Harbers in 1934 as a model housing estate, it was intended for skilled workers and middle-class servants. Given their racial politics, by embracing the garden suburb as an appropriate representation of the German Volk to the exclusion of anyone else who might live in Germany, the Nazis arguably did more to kill the future of the garden suburb than either the automobile or the modernists ever did. The story of the Garden City suburbs denouement as a pawn in 1930s European politics is complicated, but as I need to conclude, I want to return to the situation in America where planners and architects, in their effort to cope with the impact of widespread car ownership, sought to reinvent the Garden suburb. In the 1920s, the replacement of the railroad with its fixed station points by the automobile, which had almost infinite points of access, forced a rethinking of the garden suburb type. This rethinking began with <clears throat> Clarence Stein and Henry Wright's Radburn, New Jersey, located about 20 miles west of New, J New York City, across the George Washington Bridge. <coughs> then newly opened George Washington Bridge. Proposed as the city for the motor age, Radburn was planned to house 25,000 moderate income residents on a two square mile site. Despite its recognition of the car as the principal means of transportation, Radburn's central commercial district was located at a commuter train station. Only one quarter of the plan was realized as the depression killed the project. Stein and Wright believed that the pedestrian and bicycle paths which they placed in generously sized linear parks would be the way residents would move about the town, leading them to face the front doors of the houses on the greenways and to treat the cul-de-sac as service entrances. This did not work. The car was already king, Nobody was going to go visit his neighbor on a bike. And as a result, back doors facing the cul-de-sac became de facto front doors. As we have seen, Frank Lloyd Wright was well aware of the garden suburbs' value to the modern city. By 1935, when his dormant career was taking on a second wind, he offered his own version for the motor age, Broadacre City. Broadacre City was proposed as a new kind of conurbation, neither a city away from the city, as Ebenezer Howard called for, nor a garden village independent, but relying on the city as Frederick Law Olmsted advocated. Wright, a brilliant architect and planner, but not always the clearest thinker, scaled his proposal to the entire continent. Um, he had, he make no little plans, he learned that from Daniel Burnham and went way beyond, arguing that Broadacre City would have, quote, all the advantages of the city without the city, end quote. Go figure what that meant. Quote, that you cannot take the country into the city, the city has to go to the country, end quote. I don't know what that means either. But it was very influential. 
because, as you can see, by the end of the Second World War, Broadacre City, in all its megalomania, maniacal glory, influenced patterns of development that we would call sprawl. Um, this is Levittown, Pennsylvania. Right among all 20th century architect planners best understood the consequences the automobile would have on American land planning. In the post-World War II years, the tradition of the garden suburb was virtually forgotten, except by a handful of historians, notably Walter Kreese and Robert Fishman. Then, as the edifice of the modern movement in architecture and planning began to crumble in the 1970s, it became possible to see the garden suburb as a model for rebuilding our failing cities. Of course, I said I would never, I wasn't going to show you anything of mine, but enter Robert Stern. <laughs> so I end this talk as we end our book and where this quest began. In 1976, I took an initial step with sub, something I called Subway Suburb, a theoretical project pe uh, prepared for the Venice Biennale. Subway Suburb marked the beginning of an effort to turn the tide away from the destructive sprawl of the post-World War II era by proposing that garden-esque subway suburb, suburban enclaves could provide a useful model for rebuilding the devastated wastelands of American inner cities. Subway suburb proposed an affordable neighborhood of closely spaced classical and vernacular houses with shared public green spaces around which were grandly styled paired houses uh, such as John Nash had designed for the region's development 150 years before. Although Subway Suburb um, was planned to be public transit oriented, it showcased the car not only as a hallmark of middle class status, but also as a response to the reality that 30 years of sprawl development had uh, affected on America's inner cities. That reality was that the jobs were no longer in the city, that the subways were, were taking workers, were not taking the workers to work, and that city residents needed cars to get to work in the suburbs. A complete reversal of then standard planning theory. The site of the subway suburb was a devastated part of Brooklyn's Brownsville, East New York neighborhood. It was deliberately selected by me because it lay immediately south of Marcus Garvey Village, which had been designed as a low-rise, high-density alternative to the tower in the park public housing of post-World War II era. Marcus Garvey Village not only rejected the tower in the park high-rise model, it also rejected the car, as well as the vernacular taste of its intended residents. Consequently, it was a social failure. That it was designed by colleagues of mine at Columbia, we won't discuss right now. <laughs> suburb, sub, Subway Suburb was followed up with two design studios that I led in 1978, one at Yale and the other at Columbia, asking students to propose new garden suburbs for strategic sites in the South Bronx. At Yale, Gavin McRae Gibson proposed that the then notorious Charlotte Street area become a walled garden village of familiar house types from gatehouses to manor houses, but sized to the needs of small families. McRae Gibson is English born, so he knew the traditions of Parker and Unwin. At Columbia, Roger Seifter, is now one of my professional partners, transformed the blank canvas of a large site near Cortona Park into an enclave of apartment houses divining a landscape boulevard. By the 1970s, the Charlotte Street site in the Bronx, shown here in a photograph by Camilo Vergara, was a nationally acknowledged poster child for the collapse of urban neighborhoods and indeed of urban life. After many unfulfilled promises from politicians, at least in 1982, at last, in 1982, New York State Development, Urban Development Corporation undertook its redevelopment. Calling their project Charlotte Gardens, the well-intentioned but improvident UDC took a cue from Subway Suburb, one from my side, but by trucking in some 89 prefabricated one-and-a-half-story ranch-style houses 
designed with no regard for the surrounding context, context, not to mention the grammar of streets and building types that had characterized the garden villages of the past, the development was at best a misfit. The contrast between the metropolitan street grid <clears throat> and a typically stretched out ranch house was ludicrous. In, nonetheless, the houses, which were subsidized, sold out almost overnight, and Charlotte Gardens proved crucial in turning around the fortunes of the South Bronx as a whole, as it validated what Subway Suburb proposed, that ga suburban garden enclaves in urban settings were not a theoretical pipe dream, but a practical possibility, that the garden suburb could help rebuild the in abandoned inner city as a dignified setting for individual family life in a community, that its evocation of Arcadian values could make it once again an important part of the city. Ten years later, when Henry Cisneros was Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in the Clinton administration, before he had an indiscretion, the HOPE 6 program resulted in the replacement of failed American Zedlingen with garden-esque enclaves of streets lined by houses. Here we see Elm Haven houses in New Haven. It had been a social disaster of no mean proportions. They were torn down and succeeded by the eminently successful and living, livable Monterey Place. The garden suburb idea really began to rebound when Robert Davis hired Elizabeth Plater Zyberg and Andres Duani, advised by Leon Creer, to design Seaside, a resort suburb on the Florida Panhandle, just past what was then known as the Redneck Riviera. Suddenly, all the old lessons were made new again. Davis undertook Seaside's development a single neighborhood at a time, building houses that could be rented to holiday makers, in effect creating horizontal hotels, a version of the strategy to entice prospective home buyers used at Riverside and other early garden suburbs. Duwani and Plato Zyberg learned from Nash from Olmsted, from Parker and Unwin, and from so many others who had contributed to the evolution of the garden suburb. They learned from the places they knew from their own experience, like New Haven, where they had been students, from the Florida pan vernacular, and from Carl Gables, where they had settled to practice and teach. With Seaside, the garden suburb tradition found its footing once again in the form of the traditional town movement. And with many excellent plans formulated, none more so than that of Poundbury, designed in 1988 by Leon Creer for Prince Charles, uh, and still being built out today. The impact of Seaside can be seen in Celebration Florida, which was developed by the Walt Disney Company beginning in 1987. Here is a picture of Walt. The, the, um, the solid origins of celebration lie in Walt Disney's um, uh, unfulfilled promise to build the town of tomorrow as part of the 28,000 uh, Central Florida acres he assembled in 1966 to create Walt Disney World just outside of Orlando, a town no one had ever heard of at that time. Disney had begun to think of himself as much as an urban planner as an entertainer. And on planning his Florida development, he devoted considerable, atten considerable attention to what he called EPCOT, an acronym for Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow, a decidedly futuristic city designed on a radio plan not unlike the diagram devised by Ebenezer Howard in 1898, as you can see. Walt Disney died in December 1966, and the World's Fair EPCOT that was built in uh, 1982 is very different from what he had proposed. But Disney's urban vision was never quite forgotten, and by the late 1980s, Disney's CEO, Michael Eisner, seeking a use for some 10,000 acres of Orlando property the company did not need for theme attractions, there are only so many theme attractions you can have, had the idea of building a new town. As a result of a visit to Seaside, Eisner sensed the magnitude of impact that a large project in the traditional planned garden suburb towns could have, 
not only on contemporary real estate development, but also on contemporary urban life. I'm proud of my work and that of my partners, Paul Whalen and Dan Roberts, on celebration and on the great collaboration we enjoyed with Jacqueline Robertson of Cooper Robertson Partners and Ray Gindros of Urban Design Associates on this project. We all worked together to realize the first 21st century garden suburb, maybe even a garden city. Forty years ago, a theoretical design project, Subway Suburb, made me recognize that there was a lost history of planning that needed to be rediscovered for contemporary practice. Now, the collaboration of many, but especially my co-authors, uh, David Fishman and Jacob Tyloff, and the support of a great publisher, Gianfranco Monticelli and his editor, Elizabeth Blythe, have made this book possible. Um, and I hope uh, an inspiration for future ge generations. Thank you very much.